The world is going through changes. Changes happening at a speed that we have never seen before. This is leading to disruption, chaos, panic, fear, hysteria, and a turbulent economy and market loss. How do you protect your wealth in a turbulent world? How do you invest for cash flow in alternative assets to escape the rat race in times of uncertainty? How do you decentralize yourself, family, your community, your business, and your investments to become sovereign and escape the matrix? If you are looking for strategies, tactics, and techniques to escape the rat race and matrix, you are in the right place. My name is MC Lobsher, and this is Cashflow Ninja. This is Cashflow Ninja. I'm MC Lobsher. Thank you so much for joining me for another episode and spending your most valuable resource, your time, once again with me. Everything Cashflow Ninja is at CashflowNinja.com. Podcasts, books, reports, webinars, and much, much more. Everything at CashflowNinja.com. And you can sign up for the number one weekly newsletter in the alternative wealth strategy and alternative asset investing space, the Wealth Dojo, by going to CashflowNinja.com forward slash subscribe. I've got a fantastic show for you today. My guest is John Heyer. He is a tax attorney. John, it's great to see you. Good to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I've been looking forward to this conversation. I've really enjoyed uh, spending some time with you uh, at an event earlier this year. Uh, so definitely been looking forward to this uh, conversation. For my listeners and viewers that's not familiar with you and what you're up to, can you please share a little bit about your background and journey and what you get up to these days? All righty. Well, I'm a tax attorney. I'm an accountant, but not a CPA. I didn't want to take another test. I've been practicing tax law for 29 years now. I reside in Puerto Rico. There is a massive tax benefit for being here. Uh, the practice is mostly planning, tax reduction oriented. I would classify myself as aggressive, but legal and ethical. There are lines we don't want to cross, but when the law is gray, and it very often is, I'm going to play it in my favor. So when it's gray, we play. I used to do returns, but I reduced my self-hatred and I don't do them anymore. I take about one or two audits and one or two tax court cases per year. I also put out a respectable amount of information content. So seminars, classes, webinars, et cetera. And, and that's kind of how it works. I don't have employees as, as your listeners talk to me. So you already knew this, but as your listeners talk to me, you'll get that I'm very good at some things, but human beings probably are not on that list. I dislike employees. I can barely supervise myself. I certainly have not had a good track record of supervising others. So I practice solo and I love it. Yeah. And, and especially in, t in today's environment too, the nature of businesses have changed so much too. There's so much that you can automate and bring in different softwares and AIs and so forth that, uh, yeah, it may, it makes a, a solo practitioner in any field very, very viable and also uh, allows you to still operate very efficiently, right? Yeah, it allows you to leverage yourself in a different and new way. I'm just starting to play with AI and I only deal with it when I know the answer ahead of time. Because with taxes, especially on subtleties and nuances that I play, it's not quite there yet. Um, and, and speaking of modern times, I don't think the employee issue is entirely me. I have not been excessively impressed by the recent generation. Um, so one of the things that I wanted to talk to you about, I think this will be very helpful, is, you know, I jokingly say Americans, you know, used to ride on horseback, you know, with firearms and conquer the West and so forth. But, you know, over, over decades, uh, everybody's become a little bit too comfortable uh, and v extremely fearful. And as you, over the past four years, I mean, there's, I, I think we might find some people that are still hidden underneath a bed somewhere, um, probably with a mask on. So the, the dynamic has changed, uh, and, and the DNA has changed, right? So essentially, uh, what I want to get to is this, this fear, this state of paranoia from one paranoia to another and fear from, 
fear of this and fe be fearful of that. And you have to fear everything. And when it comes to government and especially, especially the tax collector and the IRS, that, that's kind of like the big boogeyman, right? The, the source of fear for a lot of folks. So one of the things that I wanted to talk to you about is if you could give us kind of a sneak peek into that world, because you deal with it all the time. And then also uh, we'll get, I, I know we're going to talk a little bit about how to position yourself to put you in a good situation so that you don't have to be fearful and you can actually, st you know, t take, take a stand uh, where, as opposed to put yourself in a terrible situation where there's not, now, now you actually do have to be fearful. Well, the rule of law is eroding, as we've seen particularly recently. It's become more open. But, for example, prosecutors have far, far too much power. There are too many laws. There's a great book, a horrifying book, but a great one nonetheless called Three Felonies a Day. And it talks about how if they really want to put you away, you broke the law. They just got to find the one you broke. With that said, we still have strong vestiges of the rule of law with the IRS, in particular, there's a specialized court, the U.S. tax court, and it is a separate independent court and really importantly specialized in tax law. That's important because neither we nor the IRS can blow smoke up their wazoo. And also they're, they're independent. See, most regulatory agencies have their own kangaroo courts internally and the judge is paid by the agency. And is which way do you think those courts rule? And you have to go through a bunch of those before you can get to a real court, which most people can't afford. The tax court is fairly accessible, fairly affordable, and still pretty independent. We're seeing it slip a little bit. I don't like that they're, the, the predictable people are putting more and more ex-IRS employees as tax court judges, and it shows. So I don't like it, but we still have an independent agency. But let's walk through. Let me get rid of 80% of the fear of the IRS. IRS marketing is brilliant. Um, you um, Americans are more fearful of their tax authorities than other countries. If you go to the European Union and talk to people, whatever their flaws, the Europeans, they do not have the fear of their tax authorities the way we do. So let's talk about that. There are four things I need you to do to wipe away 80% of the fear. There are two things to do to stay out of jail. Don't lie. It's, it's just don't lie. Or, I mean, if you're gonna, make sure you have the right last name. We know who I'm talking about. Um, don't lie and don't omit gross income. Report every penny of gross income that came in. Those are the two things that can get you put away. And I'm, of course, generalizing, but it, it's really hard to get put away if you haven't done those two things. So that's the first step. And it's not that hard. Again, just report all the gross income. Don't omit any of it. Don't play those games. If something sounds too good to be true, talk to an independent lawyer. There are a lot of schemes and scams out there, for example, with trusts, where if you have a special kind of trust, you don't pay taxes. A charity owns the trust, but you still get all the benefits of the trust. All right, you should know better. That's too good to be true. But basically, don't lie. Report all your income. That's where the trust comes into play. Once you're past that, the odds of a criminal issue, a freedom issue with the IRS are insanely low, just like not even considering, it's just not worth considering. Then in terms of an audit, there are two things I want everyone to do because the IRS's number one weapon is not arguing over the tax code. It's not arguing, do you deserve this deduction or did this planning technique, whatever it is, the Augusta rule or your self-directed IRA or your entity choice, did that work? That's actually a very tiny percent of their power. 80% of their power is two words, prove it. Most IRS personnel are very good at pointing out that you did not prove it. Now, if you can get past that, because that's their wheelhouse, it's 80% of the fight is over. So what are the two things you have to do? You do everything through a bank account. You don't pay cash in a business for expenses. You don't pay cash for expenses. You avoid that. You pay so that you can prove it. In other words, you always have a bank statement, whether it's a savings account or a checking account or PayPal or a credit card statement. Those are all bank statements. Second, 
you always have, in addition, this is and, not or, you also have a receipt and invoice for everything. And it's and. I get this all the time. John, I have a credit card statement. I don't need a receipt. Yes, you do. You need the credit card statement and the receipt. And technology is making it easier. I don't, don't, get, don't get me wrong. Do I agree with the fact that you have to track your business and life in that fashion? No, I vote against it. I vote to put myself out of work every chance I get. But the taxpayers love me. The voters love me. They keep making the law more complex. And so here I am. So I don't agree with the system. I'm just telling you what it is. If you have the bank accounts and the receipts, that takes away their nuclear weapon. What's their nuclear weapon? I've seen it done recently, and it's becoming more common. As the IRS hires more younger agents who are poorly educated to begin with, if you look at the state of the government education system, and then they follow IRS templates in an audit, and they don't really think about them, and the templates aren't always very good, the quality of the frontline examiners, in my opinion, is dropping. And they're more prone to reach for the big red atomic button, which is what? I want a receipt and a bank statement for every single transaction, for every single business for three years. Let me repeat that. The nuclear weapon for them is, I want every single receipt, I want every transaction to be justified by a receipt and a bank statement and clearly organized. If you hand us a box full of junk, we're going to throw it away. You have to organize it so that we can follow it. And their work ethic isn't great, so you really do have to do their work for them. If you can do that, you've taken away their nuclear weapon. Now all they can argue, let's think about it. I have bank statements and my QuickBooks or the equivalent, whatever it is I have, ties to the bank statements so I can verify this is what happened. All they can disagree with at that point is, did you put it on the right line of your return? They can't argue with it occurred. I spent this much money. All they can argue with is, where did you put it on the return and what effect does it have? That's a harder thing for them to argue and a lot shorter for us to argue back on. Receipts. You do need receipts or invoices for everything. Technology makes this easier. There are a bunch of apps where you can just scan them. Or, I mean, almost all receipts nowadays can be emailed. I would have two email addresses, separate companies, so that if one crashes, because the IRS doesn't care. Like my Google account got hacked. Well, they don't care. I would have two emails where all receipts are sent. And if you need to, for example, when you go out to dinner, you take a picture of the receipt. Why would you take a picture? Because you wrote on it with whom you were, what you discussed, what was the business purpose of the meeting. You make notes. You may do that on other receipts. Uh, for example, I deal with a lot of real estate investors. If you own multiple rental properties, you might have a receipt that was emailed but it's printed, you write on it, well, this was for the three rental properties and here's the address. And then you take a picture and send it to the email. And then you never look at it again until what? An audit. And then what do you do? That's why God gave you one of two things, AI or Filipino VAs. You pay them to go through it and organize it and sort it. You don't do that, but you have it. And I would be paranoid as heck. I would back that up in multiple places. But if you would just email yourself receipts directly most outfits, you go to Home Depot, you go to a restaurant, most of them will now email a receipt. Or you take a picture and email it to yourself because you had to write some notes on it to clarify things. If you do that and you have bank statements that tie to your QuickBooks and you don't lie and you report all of the gross income, 80% of the problems are gone. If you get audited, it's one of those things in life that happens. Again, with my real estate investors, I just say, listen, you got audited. You lost a roof or two or three. It sucks. Nobody likes it. Nobody wants to lose a roof, but nobody's going to die. Don't lose any sleep over it. It's just this thing has occurred, and you're going to be cutting a check for someone to represent you, and maybe you'll end up paying a little bit. In fact, if you did things right, you probably will end up paying a little bit because my attitude when we get into the next set of topics is when the law is gray, and it often is, I want you to take the position to interpret the gray in your favor. Are you going to win all of those gray positions? No, it's about a batting average. 
Um, by the way, pretty typical, if you're well advised and it's reasonably gray and you get audited, you're probably going to still win 90% if you get audited. That's a great batting average. That is well worth doing. So actually, if you don't pay, you were either too conservative or the person who audited you really, even by the standards of modern auditors, wasn't very good. But I cannot emphasize enough. If you follow those four rules, go to sleep at night, sleep well. If you get audited, it's just one of them things that happened. Your car got hit. You got to pay to have it fixed. There's an insurance deductible. I don't like it. It's not going to make me jump off a balcony. No, no. And if you're a small business owner and a real estate investor, you're almost, an, you're, you know, I kind of look at it this way. You're going to be one of the outliers if, if you haven't been audited in the next, in the next 10 years. So to your point, if you do all those things, and especially the record keeping and documentation, uh, I mean, the, you, you should be, you, put, you should put yourself in a pretty good spot. Um, and again, I love, I love the advice that you gave, um, you know, take a picture, send it to your email. And then also, you know, you could put that on maybe a hard drive and then on a cloud. So now you got three different areas. So you've got your cloud, you've got your hard drive and you have the email server. If it's Gmail, then it's on a Google cloud somewhere. So you covered three ways to, um, just to retrieve all of those, uh, documentation that you need, right? Yeah. Yeah. I'll tell you the shortest audit I ever had. I had an engineer with a W2 job, so he was very organized and meticulous, and he had a flipping business on the side, and that got audited, and this is often how audits start, and he did the perfect, this was so perfect. The agent asked for three categories. I don't remember what it was, probably office supplies, meals, and miles. Those are pretty common ones for them to look at, especially with miles. They want to see the mileage logs. This guy, he was even by engineering standards, really detail oriented. <laughs> and so he had the next day, a report with everything. I mean, he had a spreadsheet that attached to receipts. And he even put in red, it was like 1.87% of the expenses I didn't have receipts for and understand I may owe tax on those. And he had it compiled, just think geek central. And so psychologically, it was very powerful. I did something I don't normally do. The auditor was local. So I walked into her office, announced myself, and said I have the materials that she requested the day before. And I went in. She met me. She was shocked to see me because that never happens. And I dropped it on her desk, which the psychological impact of you have all that and you just as fast as possible, you're just like, boom. And she flips through it like an old phone book. She kind of goes like this. And she just thumps it down on the desk and goes, no change, which is what you want to hear in an audit. No change. We accept your tax return. And she had allocated a certain amount of time to this project. So we then spent about another two and a half hours flirting in her cube because she just wanted to chat about life. And I got to know her a little better than I wanted to. She had cat posters and pictures of the local hockey players that she was hugging. And you could tell that they knew what she did for a living because they the hug looked kind of like, she's like this, and they're like <laughs> this. And so, and I, I build the client, of course. I mean, I'm like, you had your stuff together, but she wanted to connect and spend some time being humanish. And what am I going to do? Risk the audit by giving her time to look at your stuff when she'd already said no change? I did tell him yep. if it would have been a dude, I still would have flirted. I would have built extra. Um, at what stage, though, when an audit happens, at what stage do they engage uh, with someone such as yourself, like a, like a tax lawyer? Because th this, this might be interesting, too, because there's a lot of folks that don't know how this process works. Yeah, so three steps. Step one, is your accountant gutless, which a lot of them are, not all. Um, but there are personality types, right? And, and there are stereotypes and generalizations. Let's clarify terms. There are generalizations for a reason. Stereotyping is when you apply the generalization without regard to the individual's traits. So actually look at your representative and talk to them and find out, are they afraid? If, if so, you don't want them. The second step. Is it just a numbers thing, which the vast, vast majority of audits start with? All right, here are these three or four categories, and we want you to prove 
with bank statements and receipts that these three categories, you actually got the deductions, which is what happened to my engineer friend. And if you're able, I don't expect you to do it with his speed. I mean, that, that dude was, even by engineering standards, very special. Um, but if you can, in pretty short order, come up with the records, and there's a psychology to that. For example, I like getting one category done. Let's say they hit autos. If they hit the one cate the three categories, get one done, the easiest one, as fast as you can, send it in. Why? Psychological impact. Right away, they're thinking, oh, this guy's got his stuff. They're, and then they get the second stack, and they're like, oh, no. this Because they're not going to go typically sniffing if they don't think they're going to get something. So if it's, just a if it's just a quantitative audit, if it's just a numbers game, then you don't need me. You don't need me. If you have an accountant who is not afraid or whoever's representing you is not fearful, and they're probably a lot cheaper than I am, and you can save them a bunch of time if your records are in order or you pay someone like that VA or whomever, a bookkeeper, to put it in order, a normal accountant should be able to handle that. And the only exception to that rule is if you've got a feeling in your stomach, you kind of know you did something wrong. Maybe they're not asking for the thing you did wrong, but you know you did something naughty. Then you might want to give me a call and say, listen, they're just asking right now for this, but under attorney client privilege, which is much stronger than accountant client privilege, I would like to tell you a few things that make me nervous. And I want you to tell me, should I be nervous? And if so, does it change how we handle the audit? Then you might get a hold of me. The other time to get a hold of me is when it starts going qualitative and your accountant cannot handle it. For example, we don't think you qualify as a real estate professional. That's purely an hours test. You have to spend X number of hours doing certain activities, managing property and other sorts of real estate, you have to spend a certain number of hours doing that and be able to prove it with a log. You really do need to log the hours. If you don't log the hours, you've got a very uphill fight. That's a qualitative argument. Now you make a judgment. Is my, my CPA, and I use the term generically, is your tax representative, whatever their accreditation is, are they competent in this area? Am I comfortable that they understand it? And usually if you ask them, they'll tell you, and they're usually pretty honest. Maybe on some of those issues, you bring me in. Where I often get brought in is an audit has gone for a year, and I just got one of those emails. Somebody came to me a year ago. We had a discussion. They didn't have really anything to hide. It was purely qualita or quantitative. I said, your accountant's cheaper. Just use them. If you get heebie-jeebies later, and I said, you'll know. If you get heebie-jeebies, give me a call. I just got the call. They got the heebie-jeebies. Why? It's been going on for a year. There's been no comment on the materials that were submitted after a year. And now they're talking about expanding the audit. All right, now something's going on here. And by the way, you do. what's your recourse with a bad auditor? Because sometimes, just like in anything else, you get a bad one. And I'm always polite. And I always give people the benefit of the doubt until they show they don't deserve it. But there are auditors who are just not nice people. What do you do when you get someone you can't deal with? Here's what most lawyers would do, and a lot of CPAs. I'm going to fight for you. I'm going, to, I'm going to bill the hours. I'm going to get in there and fight. That's a waste of time. Once you've determined that this person is, you just can't work with them for whatever reason, that better be a good reason. You know, they've, they've taken way too long. They don't listen. They're unreasonable in terms of they look at your records, you have everything, and they still try and nitpick. All right, now we're going to have to talk to their manager. And maybe you get somewhere with the manager and maybe you don't. If you don't, I stop spending time on the audit. I tell the auditor, we've given you what we're going to give you. Write your report. Write your report. They write a report. Here's a brilliant marketing campaign by a couple of lawyers in Florida called Shut the Fuck Up Fridays. You got to look it up on YouTube. It's hilarious. And it's true, by the way. If you're ever confronted by law enforcement, especially federal, you just tell them, you don't say, I don't want to talk. You don't get hostile. You don't tell them about how corrupt the FBI is. You just say, I'd like you to talk to my lawyer. Please talk to my lawyer. Here's the lawyer's number. And if you have a number, that really makes a statement. If you know, like, here's my lawyer's number. Please talk to my lawyer. That changes the whole dynamic. They're not allowed to talk to you. They got to talk to the lawyer. 
So these two lawyers, it's hilarious. They just have a million iterations of the same thing. They obviously, it's South Florida. They get a lot of drug offenders. The cops, whenever you talk to retired cops or off-duty people who are willing to talk, they're like, look, most of the people we catch are dumb and admit to it. So the first rule is these guys, and they're great. There's like the straight guy, like, Bob, what do we do if we're pulled over? Shut the fuck up. With the IRS, my approach is generally very cooperative. They have a lot of power. The things that they demand you give them normally, they're exceptions, but they're normally entitled to. So why would I fight that? I might negotiate and say, listen, that's a lot of work. Um, instead of my receipts for the whole year for my automobile expenses, would you pick a month or two? You pick it so you know I'm not stacking the deck. And we give you those one or two months. It's a lot less work for both of us. And by the way, for me, that's a test of how reasonable and cooperative the agent is. Yep. Because if they say, no, we want everything, I'm like, oh, okay, one of those, fine. And they can demand it. So one thing that we come back to STFU, a lot of lawyers and accountants want to show how smart they are. The time to do that is maybe like right now on a, on a webinar. Fine, fair. Market yourself. In an audit is not when you show how smart you are, if it will help the IRS. Once I've gotten to the point with an examiner that I think they're unreasonable, I know we're going to take this to tax court, and we'll talk about that in a minute. I'm not saying anything. For example, if they write a really bad audit report, which is real likely, that helps me in court, that they have a, just a terrible report. Because it doesn't give the IRS tax lawyers much to work with. Now, can the tax lawyer start the whole case over, what we call ab initio, and do discovery on everything from the beginning? They can. It's very rare in practice because they're too busy. So usually they're going to rely on the auditor's report. So if the auditor is busy poking himself in the eye by writing a lousy report, do not interrupt him. STFU in that case. Let him write their lousy report. Then we go to tax court. There's a very important document. If an audit goes badly, you get a document that's extremely important. It's, it's called a notice of deficiency. It'll come both regular mail and certified mail. And if you don't see it within a month or two after the audit, you call and start inquiring, where's my NOD? I want my NOD. Why is it? That's your ticket to tax court. You got 90 days and it's firm. If you miss it by 30 seconds, there are cases, I mean 30 seconds. It was filed online just after midnight because the internet was slow, too bad. So it's a strict deadline. But once you're in tax court, 95% of the cases settle. The IRS cannot handle all the cases that are filed. Almost all tax court cases are filed by the taxpayer. They can't handle the volume. 95% settle. What does that tell you? It tells you, like, kind of like the old joke, um, do I have to outrun the bear in the woods? No, I just have to outrun one hiker. <laughs> so if 95% of cases settle, you got to outrun one out of 20 hikers. How do we do that? Not have a really bad case. We screen before we go to tax court. I don't like losing and I don't like charging people to lose. It makes clients angry, un understandably. So sometimes you'll come to me and say, I had an audit and I think it was wrong and I want to go to tax court. And I will tell the client, I'll look at it and be like, no, actually, if you go to tax court, you're going to get crushed. You're going to be that one hiker that the other 19 are out running. This will go to trial. This will actually go to trial. And you're going to lose after paying me a lot. I do not recommend this. And normally when the lawyer says, don't pay me, they don't. Then we try to negotiate or settle. Um, but the other the 19 cases out of 20 settle. So what's your job? to have a decent enough case that we're gonna settle. I've been practicing 29 years in tax court, roughly 20 years. I've only had one case not settle. And it was a very small one where the taxpayer did not have the evidence they said they had. Um, otherwise, everything I've ever taken the tax court has settled and the taxpayer got on a bad day what they deserved. In other words, they owed less than the auditor said, but they still owed some because it wasn't perfect. And a lot of the time they've gotten more than they deserved. So again, it's a process. Nobody wants to go through this. But once no. you look at it, if you've done your four things, 
once you look at it as, all right, I lost a roof or my car got hit and I have to pay for the repairs. It's not the end of the world. It's a money thing. I don't like it. It's a money thing. And there's a lot we can do to minimize it. But man, I got to tell you, if you take away the nuclear weapon, it narrows things. Let's say that you have all the receipts and records and you haven't lied. You haven't underreported income, net gross income. You haven't underreported gross. Even if it still goes forward, your costs go like this. Your costs drop dramatically because the argument becomes so narrow. So you still, we still have the vestiges of a constitutional republic. We have not completely transformed into a bureaucratic dictatorship where unelected officials make all the law. They only make most of the law. But you still have rights. How do you achieve clarity, certainty, and predictability in a world, economy, and markets that are volatile and chaotic? How do you have confidence in an environment where change and disruption is constant? Setting up infinite banking is how you establish certainty in an uncertain world, predictability in an unpredictable world. With an infinite banking policy, you have your capital warehoused outside of the Wall Street casino where it is guaranteed, guaranteed never to go down in value and guaranteed to grow tax-free. You have guaranteed access to your capital and you also will be able to access your capital tax-free to use to capitalize on opportunities as you come across them. Creating your own banking system with infinite banking can be your secret weapon to protect and grow wealth during turbulent times. You can watch a presentation and explore infinite banking options for you and your family at yourownbankingsystem.com. That's yourownbankingsystem.com. That was one of the things from our conversation uh, that really, uh, that was kind of really a, uh, a moment where I just kind of like, I couldn't believe it when you were explaining that actually most of the laws currently in the United States are uh, come through regulatory agencies and bureaucrats. It's not even, even through Congress 90%. anymore. Yeah, it's 90%. Congress, um, illegally in my view. So FDR wanted a bunch of agencies to pass laws he could never get through Congress. And he threatened the court with packing the court, just like Biden did, that if you don't do this, I'm just going to add a billion judges and they'll do what I want, which is banana republic stuff. And well, here we are. Um, so the court got afraid and ruled that the Constitution says Congress shall make the laws. It invests the power in them. It doesn't say unless Congress doesn't feel like it, in which they, they, they can delegate it to unfireable bureaucrats who agree with them. It doesn't have that exception clause. So what the case said back in the 30s was, well, it says Congress shall make the law, but regulations are not laws. They're different. But then it said regulations have the same force and effect as a law. In other words, we can put you in prison over a regulation. So it was a word game. And so at that point, the regulatory agencies started making more and more law because they're not accountable. So I would say at this point, probably around 90% of the law. A quick way to look is ask ChatGPT, how many pages are there in the um, federal, what is it, the CFR, the Code of Federal Regulations, which is regulatory, and how many pages are there in the federal statutes, and compare the ratio. And that's a simplistic way to do it. Then throw in that judges often make law instead of interpreting it. Um, we're not a republic anymore. We're, we still have the ability to recover our republic in theory. But in terms of the practical effect of who passes the laws, a legislature, that is no longer who makes the majority of the law. Yep. And like you said, it's a word game too. What's a mandate? What's a regulation? What's a law? I mean, it's, it's kind of, uh, it's, it is interesting times for sure. Um, yeah, well, yeah. In the cursed sense of the word. Yes. Um, the other um, a topic I want to discuss with you is you see a lot in your world, uh, whether it's in court or people coming to you with different things. What are some of the tax strategies that you're seeing out now uh, there that's working, some that's not working, some that is being challenged and so forth? Okay. Um, I love 
retirement accounts, especially Roths, and I would include 401ks, health savings accounts, rollover business startups are a huge one because it's a special kind of 401k where you can physically work for the business even though it's owned by a 401k, which is normally prohibited. And you can take a salary from the business and that would normally be prohibited. So rollover business startups um, and the other variants of retirement accounts. I mean, if you look, one, one great way to do research, if Ron Wyden, communist from Oregon in the Senate, he's the head of the Senate Finance Committee, or ProPublica, a left-wing organization, if they hate a planning technique, I am very interested. They hate Roth IRAs. I am consequently very interested. Um, so there's a lot you can do with those accounts. A lot of little things add up. Little things like you know, writing off your boondoggle for education, writing off your car, writing off your home office, the Augusta rule, the stuff that's out there. Now, the difference between what's on TikTok, like, oh my God, TikTok, if it's on TikTok, it's totally correct. I, I would totally just, you don't really need me anymore. Just listen to TikTok. No, no, God, no. Um, they usually leave a lot out that gets a lot of people into trouble. But there are a lot of little tricks that are because of the internet have become well publicized. Some work, some don't. I named a few that work. What else do I like? Um, captive insurance is up in the air. There's been some negative case law. So I like captive insurance. I think the IRS is attempting to define it out of existence. And that battle is still ongoing in the courts. So if you're going to use exotic insurance, for example, insurance to protect you from regulatory events where the premium is 10% of the payout, those have not done well in court. On the other hand, if you're thinking based on where normal insurance is at, liability and flood and hurricane, we know that the insurance market right now is in a vast amount of turmoil. Prices are going up. Some places you can't get insurance or for certain things you can't get insurance. If you think about self-insuring in that fashion, a captive may make sense, but you always have to put economics before taxes. In other words, when you look at what it means to self-insure, is it cheaper to pay the higher rates that we now have today for that, or is it truly cheaper to have your own self-insurance? Now, when it's you can't get insurance at all, let's say you have properties that are prone to flooding and you just can't get flood insurance, but you want some. Okay, you know what? A captive makes a lot of sense in that case. It's what I would call more conventional insurance. Yeah. But there is a certain threshold size-wise. I like opportunity zones a lot, especially for real estate investors. But here's a subtle one. Um, dentists, for example, who open a new office. First thing I would do is look at a map of the geographic region I'm operating in and see, am I willing to locate that office in an opportunity zone near me? If so, you may be able to sell that office, that part of the practice, tax-free after 10 years. That's a big deal. Uh, what else do I see? Oh, I like the defined benefit retirement plans where you can make massive contributions, three, 400,000 a year and take a deduction. I like self, again, I, I lean heavily towards the retirement accounts. That's one of my main weapons. There are other ones out there. You'd mention some things not to do. If it's too good to be true, it's too good to be true. I see an infinite variation of trusts that purport that you can use a trust, still have the benefit of the asset or the income, but the trust owns it and it's non-taxable. See, if the trust truly owns it and you don't have access, let's say it's a charitable trust or an IRA is another form of trust, the trust really owns the property and you're not allowed to use the property and you get no income directly or indirectly, the trust doesn't pay your bills, et cetera, et cetera, it might be legit. But if it's a deal where no taxes are paid, the trust owns the property, owns the business, owns the income, but you still get a benefit somehow. It pays your mortgage, it pays your meals, it pays your car, or it lets you use its house, or it lets you use its car. That's, that's just a sham. And, and, and the permutations of that marketing change faster than COVID. The substance doesn't change. But, but I've, the, seen the, the a, I've seen a lot of those. Oh, yeah, they're everywhere. Yeah, yeah like that's, uh, I, I, the TikTok and Instagram. Those. 
Yeah. The IRS is dead right about those. That's a fraud. Yeah. There's uh, every other. It's funny when you and also the algorithm of these platforms, when you click on one of those because people send me to those. Hey, have you seen these? And you click on those. Not every single time you go back to look up something else. You get about 20 more of these videos of the exact That's same what... thing. Um, I didn't realize the there were so many of them out there. Oh, yeah. TikTok does that with news as well. People who get news from TikTok are idiots because um, what it does is, first of all, the algorithm, just as you pointed out, figures out what you want to hear and feeds it to you after it's filtered through what the Chinese Communist Party wants to hear you. And I'm not kidding. If you look at, for example, how they report on the Ukrainian war or on the Israeli war, it's going to be completely consistent with the Chinese Communist Party's position on that at about nine to one. They'll give you just enough, for example, pro-Israeli or pro-Ukrainian view to say that they give you both sides. But if you look at the algorithms and what they do on TikTok, it's, right. it's just raw brain rot. Just raw yep. brain rot, all of it. What are, what are some of the other interesting things, John, that you're seeing in, in tax court? What are some of the things that you have found interesting uh, this year, some things that people might also not be aware of that, that is get, either getting people in trouble or they've had favorable rulings on them? Um, we just saw one, a very favorable ruling on options come out. Now, I ought to be careful because people often take this to mean I can do whatever I want because people oftentimes use options to do things that are otherwise impermissible, thinking they have a magic solution. But there was a case, it was a very large developer, and they own land inside of a C-Corp, and they used an option, the, the, the same family of companies, they had a ton of companies. There was another company that was essentially a consultancy. And the consultancy, in exchange for getting zoning and entitlement on this land, that the C, so the C corporation developer owned this land, and owning land in a C corporation long term is not a great move. They wanted to get some of the value out of the C corporation and into an LLC, which tax wise makes a lot of sense. And they did it really legit. It was a lot of money. They ended up moving, if I remember right, something like $14 million of value because the C-Corp owned the land. The other company was the one that was going to develop it and entitle it. And it was they did a great job of documenting that without developing and entitling, and get, especially the political side, getting the zoning and so on, mm -hmm. that the land was worth way less. And so the option was set at the present fair market value. And of course, once the, they, they did succeed, it took years, like a decade. But when the consulting firm that had an option on the property, the consulting firm did all the things. And it was, again, owned by pretty much the same people, the same family. So it was the same humans. Yeah. The consulting firm did a lot of this work. And then the option was exercised and the land sold for much more. And so the value above and beyond, so the value 10 years ago was, let's say, $12 million, and I think they sold it for $24. let us just use that as a makeup number. I think I'm pretty close. The option was for the 12 Here's what it's worth today. And then they spent 10 years working on making the land worth a lot more through the political process. And after X number of years, 10, 12 years had passed, they succeeded. And so then they went back and said, well, the value is much higher. We're going to exercise this option. And the IRS came back and said, this is bogus. This is a sham, which a lot of options are. Just like trusts, a lot of options are not real. They are a sham. But here the IRS lost. Um, with the court, and, and there was, I actually know the guy who argued the case. The, the, IR, the, the, the taxpayer said, there was real consideration. We did a lot of work, a ton of work, that we could have gotten nothing for. It could be we never would have got the zoning. So there was real consideration for the option. It was legitimate and real. This is something people do. The two companies were truly separate. They did a really good job of maintaining the books and records, the minutes. They had a lot of companies that did different things for business reasons. And so the court said, you know, given the structure, we're going to honor this. 
And so they succeeded with that option in moving, my recollection is about 10 million of value out of the double taxed world of C-Corps. So roughly between the 21% corporate rate and the dividend rate, let's say that would be taxed at about 35%. They moved it into the capital gains world, which in their bracket, it's still taxed at 23%, but you know, that's, that's 12 points less. That's a lot of money. Yeah. So that's, in fact, I'm going to cover that case. I do a webinar that's a, it's behind a paywall. I do a webinar twice a month and that's going to be the main topic uh, a week from today, actually on, on that webinar, because I have a lot of real estate investors on it. So I want to go through in detail what made this option legitimate and how might they have screwed it up. So for investors in general, I thought that was a really, really important case. I have not seen a lot of super decisive tax court cases in the recent past, which is good in a way. It means that really juicy, fun stuff that I, I like it when there's a tax court decision because that's how I get educated. But if there's not a lot of them, it means that there's a lot of settlements as I said, normally happens, but maybe even more than normal. There was one last year that got into shared appreciation mortgages, which I've been promoting those for 20 years and not to toot my own horn, but we got exactly the result I've been predicting for 20 years. What's a shared appreciation mortgage? Usually you use it with an IRA. Let me give you an example. Let's say you're flipping properties. I've got money in an IRA and I JV with you. What's the problem with that? you are in a trade, an active ongoing trader business. When my IRA invests in an active, continuous, ongoing trader business, basically it sells stuff over and over, or it provides services. Those are two examples. You pay a tax called UBIT, U-B-I-T, unrelated business income tax. This is a situation where not only are IRAs and 401ks not tax-free, there's a really high tax. So what's a better way to structure it? So I JV with you, what happens? We have a partnership under tax law and the anti Las Vegas rule applies, right? The Vegas rule is what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. The anti Vegas rule is whatever happens in the partnership, the JV that my IRA has with you happens in my IRA. So if you flip properties, which is an ongoing trader business, you're selling a thing over and over, that is attributed to my IRA. And that's why even though my IRA did not directly sell something, it did it indirectly through our partnership and it's treated as if it had done it directly. And so I pay this terrible tax, it's 37% typically, and that's just federal. You throw in some state tax and we're in the 40s. Yep. Well, we managed to get around it legit, legit and legal-like we change the relationship. Instead of you and I having a JV, my IRA lends you money and my interest rate is 50% of the profit on the deal. Now, you have to draft that really carefully. There have been tax court cases in the past that lay out, here's, because the IRS can always look at substance. What are you actually doing? So I can put on paper, this is a loan. But if we start reading it and it's like, John has the ability to take out money when he wants and put in money when he wants, and he has 50% of the votes and the court says, wait a minute, you put loan on the title, but that sounds like a JV, an LLC operating agreement. So you know what? We're going to treat it like what it is. So you got to be careful when you draft these shared appreciation mortgages, that it is a mortgage there's a term, there's a due date, there's collateral, that my control is consistent with that of a creditor and not a partner or a manager. And that the only funky thing in this note, it looks like a note, like a note, note, note with a big N, big note, except for one thing, the interest rate is funky. Instead of 8% or 20% or whatever, the interest rate is I get 50% of the profits on the financed deal a shared appreciation mortgage. We did have a nice case law come out that I thought was a clearer, a much better case than the last hundred years of case law that really clarified and crystallized. It laid out eight tests 
that if you meet more than eight, and I try to meet all eight, I try to meet all eight, but if you meet those tests, that shared appreciation mortgage really is debt and not a disguised JV. Well, in an IRA, that's extremely important because now I'm not paying any tax. Same fundamental economics, but tax situation totally changes. And I was really happy to see that case come out. Um, it, it really, I like, of course, being proved to be right, but I also like to know that when I'm wrong, I like to know. So if a case comes out once in a while, I'll guess at something that's gray. And by definition, if it's gray, we don't know the answer. So what answer do I always give? The one that helps the taxpayer. But right. sometimes what happens to the gray? We get a bad case and it goes the other way. So those are some that come off the top of my head. Let me tell you where I have not seen case law and I'm really happy about that. Rollover business startups. So your 401k owns a C corporation. This is great for lawyers, dentists, content producers, flippers, assigners. You have an active business. You run it through a C corporation that pays 21% and your Roth 401k owns 98%, you own 2%. And there are reasons for that. I won't go into technical reasons. What do I love about that? Let's take my personal example. I live in Puerto Rico. I get a very good tax rate for what? Work I do in Puerto Rico. But when I do work in Ohio, and there are different definitions of work, that gets complicated. But let's yeah. say I do work in Ohio. Where do I pay tax? Well, in, in the U.S., so I run work in the U.S. through my rollover business startup. What do I do? I, I have a speaking business. Sometimes I get on a stage and speak, and I make money, presumably, usually. And since Puerto Rico doesn't cover that, I have that C corporation. I used $50,000 from my Roth 401k to create it, and you do pay specialists to create it. Even I didn't do that. I had someone else do it. They were actually cheaper than I would have been. It was cheaper for me to pay them than to figure it out myself. So I know right. the rules, but they know them so well that they set it up. So what happens? My, my Roth 401k puts 50 grand in a C Corp. And the C Corp didn't even need 50 grand. I mean, how much capital do I need to go fly somewhere to speak? Right here, right here's the capital. But I like the 50 grand just from one of my rules is whenever possible, Give the bureaucrat what they expect to see. If I would have funded that with five grand, it's not technically illegal. It just looks really weird and it invites attention. And that's not what I want. So I want to put a number when possible. It's not always possible. But whenever possible, give the bureaucrat what they expect to see, which is why I funded it with 50 grand. I do business there in the rollover business startup, the C Corp pays 21%. When it makes distributions, 98% goes into my Roth 401k, 2% goes to me. I love it. It's What's it doing to my Roth 401k? It's converting my services that I'm, I'm, I'm paying 21%. Some people think that's too much. For a lot of people, that's a really good rate. I'm paying 21% on my services in the U.S. And whatever's left after my few expenses and taxes dumps into my Roth 401k. The Roth 401k is becoming large quickly. That is one of my favorite techniques. I am so happy I haven't seen case law. It means the IRS has not been going after these. And in fact, um, I just talked to someone very knowledgeable in the space because since there have not been any tax court cases, we don't have a lot of guidance. There's a lot of gray with rollover business startups. So who did I talk to? I actually paid a lawyer. He's one of the few. There, there are so few lawyers that have experience with rollover business startup audits. They're fairly rare, and it's fairly few lawyers who've done more than a handful. Well, I just got to interview one who's done a bunch of them. And it really helped my thinking on how to structure these and what you can and cannot do. And so I'm happy that I have not seen case law on these. Awesome. That is my favorite tax planning technique, I would say.
Um, you know, the best thing you could do for a young dentist or doctor before they hire an employee, because when is it hard to set up a rollover business startup? Once you've got employees, once you've got employees, setting one of these up is much, much harder. So if you have a dentist, let's say, or a lawyer or whatever, who's young and they got a W-2 job and they're thinking of going out on their own, jump into their lives. It doesn't matter if, you, if they're like you're on a, on a plane in first class and you've never met them and you overhear them talking because you're nosy. You jump in there and you tell them you need a rollover business startup. You need to set your dental practice up before you have employees in a C corporation that is allowed to pay you a salary. So normally when you have a company owned by an IRA or 401k, it's not allowed to pay you a salary. That's a prohibited transaction, which is a bad thing. You don't want to do those. In a rollover business startup, it's allowed to pay you a salary. And everything else is taxed at 21% and dumps into the Roth 401k. Well, when is the time to do that? When you don't have employees, when is that normally before you start the business? Now, for some people, if it's just you in the business, you may be able to do it because you don't have employees at the time. Do it before you get employees. I've also had a few people who exited. I had a couple recently call me. They have a car dealership they're selling, and then they're going to go start another business. And I said, so the day you sell the car dealership, other, other than getting really drunk on some really bougie bourbon, you, you have no employees for that day. And they said, yeah, probably for like a year. We're just going to take off, and then we'll go start something else. I said, set up a rollover business startup when you have no employees. Have it, here's a great term that's unforgettable, a prophylactic rollover business startup. I don't even know what business I'm going to do in it. I just want to have one so that when I have an ongoing trader business, I have this thing ready. I don't make the mistake of hiring employees and then maybe I'm unable to create one or it's very expensive to create one. That is one of my favorite tax planning techniques. I love these and they're starting to get discovered, but so far, Ron Wyden has not written a report on them. ProPublica just started looking, but they have no conclusions yet. Gotcha. So I think they're gonna hate it once they dig into it, but they have not yet popularized it to the point where Congress may consider passing a law against it. John, where can um, my listeners, where can they follow you? Where can they uh, get in touch? And also, where can they stay informed of all the many things? Because you have a ton of content uh, and a community, and you do these monthly webinars on topics, uh, such as the ones that we're talking about. Where, where can they reach out, and where can they follow? So the place to find me is, is um, taxreductionlawyer.com, taxreductionlawyer.com. You can also go to my Facebook page. In fact, um, one thing I have to get done this weekend I'm behind on is putting out my little one-minute video clips. I've gotten so busy with work that I haven't been always marketing consistently. I don't presently have a lot for sale on the website. In other words, I have no upcoming events for the moment. I just kind of took a breather. There will be. So if you get on the mailing list, if you go to taxreductionlawyer.com, you get on my mailing list, you'll get some articles with a lot of content. And yeah, there's periodically going to be a sales thing that maybe you're interested in, maybe you're not, like the usual. Um, and for the moment, I'm taking it easy. I will probably have stuff for people to attend, in this case, virtually, because I just did an event in Puerto Rico live not long ago. Yep. I'm going to probably, for example, put together an entities course online, Zoom only, in the very near future. Um, but I'm living a good life. I'm happy. So I'm pretty chill about the pace at which I put things out and how hard I push it. Uh, hours in terms of hiring me, I'm increasingly booked up one or two months ahead. I do a lot of planning work. My most common engagement is people send me all their stuff, their QuickBooks, their tax returns, everything. And then they say, what can I do better? That is by far the most frequent thing I do. Like I said, I take one or two audits, one or two tax court cases a year to stay on top of it. The good news is you're dealing with me. The bad news is you're dealing with me. I don't have anyone to delegate to. Um, so it does limit my bandwidth. 
but you're also not dealing with a flunky because I, I just can't handle flunkies. I've proved this over time. Thanks for coming on the show and just sharing your insights and your knowledge and providing so much value for all of my listeners and my viewers. This has been a blast. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for having me. And thank you to my listeners and my viewers for again spending your most valuable resource, your time with me on the show today. Everything Cashflow Ninja is at CashflowNinja.com. Books, podcasts, reports, webinars, and much, much more. And don't forget to sign up for the number one weekly newsletter in the alternative wealth strategy and alternative asset investing space, the Wealth Dojo, by going to CashflowNinja.com forward slash subscribe. Until next time, live infinitely. This presentation is for educational and informational purposes only. The information being presented and considered does not consider your particular financial objectives or situation, and it does not make personalized recommendations. This material is not intended to replace the advice of a qualified tax and legal advisor or other qualified professionals, and you should not use the information in place a customized consultation with a licensed professional regarding your specific personal financial objectives, situation, and needs. We believe the information provided is reliable, but we do not guarantee its accuracy, timeliness, or completeness.